Please give him a warm welcome. <laughs> It's very, very glad to be here and really happy that this uh, festival is taking place in a friendly and non-sectarian atmosphere and that there are so many people milling about at different seminars and sessions. Uh, especially pleased to see so many young people here. Last night when we had the rally, um, I was just looking around and I think the average age must have been about 24, 25, which is always nice. I mean, people like us, you know, bring that average down a bit, but never mind. Uh, so it's, it's very positive, and I hope it goes uh, from strength to strength, because heaven alone knows uh, the left needs to get its act together. Uh, it, we're living in times where the right is getting stronger and stronger, whether it's the center or the extreme center of politics, as I call it, in which center left and center right have more or less merged in terms of the fundamentals uh, today, capitalist and imperial fundamentals. And then they have an extreme right which takes various forms and which is growing all over Europe. And the left is rather weak at a time when it should be much, much uh, stronger. So th the subject I'm going to talk about is, is, is not unimportant. Uh, US is the American empire on the decline. There have been a lot of articles, uh, essays, books, from the 70s onward, actually. Paul Kennedy's big book talked about the decline of the big powers. And quite a lot of the more recent books uh, including by very, very good writers and very uh, gifted uh, Marxists like the late Giovanni Arighi, have been predicting that the American empire is really on the decline and it, it will disappear. Now, he gives, of course, a whole array of arguments which I don't happen to agree with, but that doesn't mean they're not important arguments. But effectively, the argument goes like this. All empires collapse and all empires crumble, sooner or later. And the American empire is no exception. And the European empires collapsed, and this is now beginning to affect the American empire, that they have overreached, that their economy is in a mess, and they are no longer capable of ruling the world. Now, I think that a lot of, you know, the, the, some of these arguments are, of course, truisms. We know that. But we have to analyze the situation very concretely. Some of those books which were written in the 70s and 80s <coughs> basically could not predict, as very few people could, the huge changeover that took place in the world in the late 90s with the collapse of the Soviet Union, with the fact that large numbers, millions of people, felt that there was now no longer any alternative, that capitalism was triumphant. But the one word which had not been used prior to this, I mean, if you go back and look, capitalism was a word which no one actually wanted to mention. Uh, at the big time of the Cold War, from 1917 to 1990. The left mentioned it and talked about it. Conservatism barely accepted its <coughs> existence. Uh, so, nor did they like the use of the word imperialism. In place of capitalism, the word that was constantly used was freedom. And in place of uh, imperialism, they didn't actually discover another world. They sometimes called it post-colonial hangovers. But effectively, what happened to the world after 1919 made it impossible to conceal the fact that capitalism had scored a huge triumph, that globalization, as it was called, was just the latest phase in capital expansion on a global level that virtually every market, that every region that had resisted the entry of private capital was now, had fallen, every bastion had fallen, and that it had been a huge victory for the United States. Even so, 
from the 90s onwards to use the <coughs> word imperialist about the United States was considered, if not wrong, but it was not a subject to be discussed in polite circles. <laughs> if you talked about imperialism, you were living in the past. Slowly, that began to change too with the American elite deciding, well, if that had to be the way, that had to be the way, no longer objecting strenuously to being referred to as an empire, which they had been for a long, long time, uh, but which uh, they had a, a definition we, uh, they had rejected, saying we're not the empire, the European empires, of course, were proper empires, we're not. So let's just try and unravel these arguments. The United States, of course, from its early life onwards, was built as an empire. It was an inter internal empire, expanding based on the genocide of the indigenous people, taking more and more land, taking land from Mexico, expanding internally, but by internally I mean encroaching on the property of its neighbors, being California, Texas, all these territories were seized from the Mexicans. So it was essentially an empire based in the Northern Hemisphere, which then established an iron control of South America, which they referred to as their backyard. And that this then uh, accounted for their initial period of expansion. What made the American entry onto the world stage uh, imperative from the point of view of capital and empire was the First World War. And many of you will know that next year will mark the centenary of the First World War, which will be presented as a great huge event, wonderful event, so many brave people died. It's true, so many brave people died. The bulk of them were workers. The bulk of them, whether it was Germany or France, or Italy or Britain or Russia or the United States, the bulk of the people who were recruited to fight in that war were workers. And no doubt next year, probably, the, uh, this festival will uh, devote some time to explaining and developing the history of that particular conflict as a counter to what we are likely to see from the uh, governing hegemonic cultural political elite which rules this country. How the war will be presented in Germany, I have no idea, but presumably they will put on a good show as well. The fact is, the fact is that the First World War was nothing more, literally nothing more than a war between competing imperial interests. And if you look, it was triggered off by an event, but the war was an attempt by the Germ Germanic empires, the Austro-Hungarian and, of course, rising Germany, which Bismarck had welded together into a state, and challenging the hold and the grip of uh, Britain and France in particular. No one challenged the United States control of South America. It was a largely speaking, a European war, and it was a war to gain more colonies. And the consistent pattern in German propaganda was, we are the largest country here, and look how many colonies we have compared to Britain, which is a piddling <laughs> little island on the northern fringes of Europe, and it virtually rules three continents. Look at the French, they control North Africa, etc., etc., and the Germans must have their own territories. That is what that war was about, nothing else. And the tragedy of that war was that prior to that war, the organized workers' movement, the political parties affiliated to the Second International, had decided, because they had predicted the war, the last Congress of the Socialist International of all of Europe's social democratic parties, which included left and right, had voted that if war breaks out in 1914, the workers have to make two declarations. Workers have no country. And we will go on a collective European strike to bring this war to an end. This, of course, never happened. 
had it happened, the war could have been stopped and you would have had upheavals in country after country. This never happened because, it, here we have to be blunt, the majorities in the social democratic parties capitulated to national chauvinism and couldn't resist the ideological hegemony of the rulers, the people who really ruled the country and caved into them. But there were splits. I mean, in this country, believe it or not, Ramsay MacDonald, senior figure in the Labour Party, was against the war, voted against it, resisted. Keir Hardy opposed the war. In France, the great socialist leader Jean Jaurès uh, opposed the war and was shot by a right-wing fanatic. So it's not that the parties, but by and large, they were taken over. And once the war fever reached a certain pitch, uh, that was it. Workers were killing each other all over Europe. Millions died. And these killings cannot be blamed on any section of the left, by the way. These were killings carried out by the right and its allies within the social democratic movement. No blame can attach to... Uh, uh, the left, leave alone those who met in a tiny Swiss village in Zimmerwald in 1915 to try and bring the war to an end, consisting of all the oppositionists within the Social Democratic parties. And Lenin famously, representing Russian social democracy, said, one lesson we must never forget, our enemy is at home that the enemy we have to fight is our own rulers, that for us, for the Russian workers, the enemy is the Tsar of all the Russias and the structure he has created and those who collaborate with that structure. And this should be the method going out, which was also taken up by Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, the only two members of the German Social Democratic Party uh, in Parliament, Liebknecht, had voted against the war credits, giving war credits to the German state. So there was an honorable minority. And one of these honorable minorities created, worked for, and made the Russian Revolution. And the emergence, and the, the, the Russian revolutions of February and mainly November, create, transformed world politics in a thunderclap. That was it. Because this was the only revolution that had been pre-planned as a socialist revolution. We will, you know, can discuss some other time what happened to it, but in 1917 it was seen as the beginning of the end for capital and capitalism. And that is the time, roughly, that the Americans decided to enter the First World War and send American soldiers to Europe <coughs> because the Russian Revolution was getting out of control and some order had to be maintained. Prior to that, they had been neutral between Germany and Britain. After all, there were large numbers of German Americans, migrants from Germany, so why should the elite take sides? <coughs> With the Russian Revolution, they plumped on the side of Britain because <coughs> they said it was a stronger imperial power than the Germans and one side had to be defeated. Had this not happened, we would probably have had a stalemated solution to the First World War with neither power winning. Had that happened, uh, the whole face of Europe might have been very different. We don't know. You wouldn't have had the Treaty of Versailles. You wouldn't have had the creation of conditions that finally led to a fascist takeover of Germany backed by the German capitalists, etc., etc. So the First World War is a decisive fact of the 20th century from which all flows. That war left the British Empire in control, certainly, but with the Americans looking over its shoulder. And it took another 30 to 40 years for the British Empire to collapse. And that period of inter-imperialist rivalries would not happen again in that fashion. Because after the Second World War, the Germans you know, made a huge attempt to take Europe, came very close to it. Uh, if you like, that was a European Union designed by the German uh, elite with wearing the fascist mask and an attempt designed to make Europe as a real rival to the United States. That was Hitler's plan. I mean, we talk about nothing but the Holocaust, which is fine, 
uh, or not fine because there are many other aspects of German politics which are usually ignored. And if you read Hitler's speeches, horrific though they are, the, when he talks politics, the target is the British Empire. Why should they have an <coughs> empire? So the First World War arguments being rehearsed again for the second time in the Second World War. So part of the Second World War was certainly a war between different imperial powers. And the Germans came pretty close. The Americans at one stage thought that the Germans were going to take Europe, that they would have to negotiate with them, and ask Churchill to send the entire British fleet, naval fleet, to safe havens on the American coastline so it could be protected. Uh, Churchill, you know, uh, had other ideas and said we're not going to go down so easily, but it was touch and go. What happened? It wasn't by no means preordained. Had the Germans won Europe, the United States would have done a deal with them. The United States carried on recognizing the Vichy collaborationist regime in France till 19, late 1944. It was no, not late, but after June, they broke off relations after the Normandy landings in June because they wanted to keep, you know, all options open. So that phase of inter-imperialist wars, which created revolutionary possibilities all over the world, in fact, the Russian Revolution from the First World War and the Second World War <coughs> produced an entire wave of decolonization. Uh, most of Asia, Africa fought, the Japanese struggle against the Japanese produced a huge uh, radical wave in China and a revolution which ended the power of the landlords, took China out of the world market. And so these were revolutionary uh, events, which is why the 20th century has you know, rightly been described as an epoch of wars and revolutions. So what about now? Now, you have inter-imperialist rivalries very restricted. If you look at the situation now, it is much worse in terms of European independence than it's ever been. The European Union is by and large a subsidiary of the United States. Mo many of the European states function as vassal states, especially this country which is why I'm always amused by these arguments of independence means getting out of Europe. But getting out of Europe, whether it's right or wrong, is another question. But getting out of Europe just means reinforcing the vassal subordinate status in relation to the United States. And the United States doesn't want Britain to get out of Europe because it sees it as its Trojan mule inside the European <laughs> Union. <laughs> Uh, uh, it uses it, it works it, it doesn't want Europe to be without Britain because it feels without Britain it might move just marginally to the left. Uh, so th this whole notion somehow of the European Union being the main target is grotesque as far as this country is concerned. And I'm amazed no one ever asks these idiots from UKIP, what would independence mean outside the European Union? Are you prepared to break from the United States? Your entire defense structures, the city of London, are linked in very, very closely. Nothing do happens in the British Foreign Office or the British Defense Ministry without the approval of the Pentagon or the State Department, regardless now of who's in power. So this period, which opened up after the 90s, saw the reassertion and now the establishment of US hegemony on a global pattern. They wanted to assert their control over the world's energy resources, over unstable countries which weren't doing their bidding, and they did it through wars. So all the talk in the 90s of the peace dividend, the period of wars is over, turned out to be wishful thinking on the part of those who believed it. Never happened like that. Instead, the United States reemerged as the hegemonic power. You just have to look in Europe. There is no independent film industry, by and large. Most of European culture mimics American culture. 
whether it's creating TV serials, whether it's creating movies, even the theater has been affected in most countries, apart from Germany and uh, Spain, curiously enough. So US hegemony exercised through soft and hard power is very dominant, very, very dominant today, which is why it can uh, go, go across and occupy a country temporarily and come out. Now, the one point you have to understand is that American imperial hegemony was never exercised through direct occupations, or rarely. The Philippines in the early years of the 20th century uh, and some parts of Europe later, but by and large the American way of running the world has usually been finding local satraps and finding local people relays to do their bidding, which is much more convenient because you spend less money. You don't have your civil service sent out there. You don't have your military station there. And that is how they're beginning to do it again, which is why they go in, they occupy, they withdraw, they think they've created a puppet state. Sometimes they have setbacks, and other times they're more successful. But the fact that the American military part is so dominant that the next eight, the military budgets of the next eight countries in line, if you add them up, can't compete with it. And that the basic money on military technology is coming from the American state. And you see how they will use this military power and they, how they already are using this military power to make up for their economic weaknesses, which are not something that they can solve easily, but they can be solved, because unlike Britain or the European powers, they are not a tiny country. They are half, you know, they are a continent, virtually. I mean, Canada now more or less does their bidding. They've lost South America for the moment, thank God. But they haven't given up on trying to take it back, or the bulk of South America, if not all of it. And, uh, but the United States itself is a huge country. If American capitalism wanted to, it could revive, revive itself there in one way or the other. But the big shift that has happened in the 21st century is that the center of the capitalist world market is it's shifted eastwards. China now is the dominant economic power. The question is this, as some people have written and alleged, is Chinese economic dominance going to lead to Chinese militarism, the creation of a Chinese army, and military competition with the United States, uh, in which the two powers will clash? Huge debates going on. I don't think so. The evidence so far is that the Chinese military, it's not that they aren't building, they are, but their main effort is to defend their zone of interest, which is China and the regions around it. That is the aim, which is why the United States has built, just constructed a new base in, in Australia with the support of the Australian Labor Party, which is why the United States is building bases once again in Vietnam basically trying to surround China, and which is why they are very keen to have permanent military bases in Afghanistan, because it's a country that borders China, not to wage war, but to just show the Chinese who has the military dominance of the planet, and the Chinese aren't even resisting that. They're saying we will just defend our own country and our interests militarily if we have to, otherwise we operate economically. And this is how they do in South America and Africa. Chinese investments are huge. It's perfectly possible a clash might be engineered to bring the Chinese down a peg or two, which would be a huge disaster uh, on a global scale. But apart from that, I think you know the, the picture is very clear. American empire remains dominant despite setbacks here and there. I remember when the Vietnamese inflicted a military defeat on them, a political and military defeat on them in April 1975, large numbers of people said this is the end of the Americans. They will never be able to intervene anywhere again. Even at that time, some of us said that this was a foolish idea because they would recover from this. And the military defeat 
was not so key for them as the political demoralization inflicted in their own country by a huge anti-war movement. That shook them because this anti-war movement went into the heart of the American army. You know, when you have 100,000 GIs and ex-GIs marching outside the Pentagon and saying, ho, 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 Chi Minh, the NLF is going to win, then there is grave, great reason for the <coughs> Pentagon leaders to worry because their apparatus has been infected. And so they decided on that never to have conscription again, but to have a volunteer army. That shook them because this anti-war movement went into the heart of the American army. You know, when you have 100,000 GIs and ex-GIs marching outside the Pentagon and saying, ho, 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 Chi Minh, the NLF is going to win, then there is grave, great reason for the <coughs> Pentagon leaders to worry because their apparatus has been infected. And so they decided on that never to have conscription again, but to have a volunteer army and to recruit mercenaries from Central America, Africa, wherever they could lay hands on people. Now what this means for us concretely is to just understand the scale of the project. That till this empire is brought low, social change becomes difficult. It's not that it becomes impossible, but you have to at least understand who the enemy is, and the enemy is not in your own countries. Of course, primarily it's there, but the enemy is this whole network of American military uh, industrial uh, structures which have been embraced by politicians in Europe and of course North America, which will try and stop movements from going beyond certain limits. Uh, and for that reason, what happens in the political consciousness of American citizens becomes absolutely crucial. We need their help, which is what I always say in the United States. I say it's not a question of flattering. You don't feel flattered because it's an awful thing, your country being what it is. But it is your responsibility to get this under some form of control. You have to do it. And in this aspect, it's been astonishing. It's been astonishing the speed with which Obama has totally demobilized the anti-war movement and how many left liberals who would have been <coughs> screaming blue murder have capitulated. If Bush had done half the things that Obama is doing, there would have been real outrage and anger. But because it's Obama doing them, with a smile on his face and a non-white skin, people imagine that that's fine. And it's not fine. It's actually very dangerous. And it disarms the left liberals and Americans who have gone along with this, because the next time you have a Republican doing it, they will do as the Tories say now. But what are we doing that Blair has not done? whether it's a question of privatizing health, attacking state education, every single thing, the plans were already ready in waiting. Some of them had been implemented, some were going to be implemented. And in the United States, this of course is on a much, much uh, larger uh, scale. The one area where the United States has been outwitted is South America. And it's interesting to study. It's been outwitted by a group of political leaders born out of large social movements in Venezuela, in Ecuador, uh, in uh, Bolivia, and even in Brazil, the largest country of South America, though the, the, the social economic policies of the Lula government are at variance with most of the Bolivarian states. On foreign policy, the Brazilians have said, we will never be used, we will never allow our state or our military to be used to destabilize countries with which we might not agree on their social economic measures, and they effectively told the Americans that publicly. So the United States has temporarily, I think, though I hope permanently, lost control of South America, which explains a great many things, especially the way in which even the European press has been reporting developments in South America. It's the only part of the world where there has been a shift to the left, and a shift in the interests of workers, peasants, the poor, those who can't afford to live in these societies. 
not unimportant <coughs> in the in in the world uh, in which we live in. So, by giving you this picture, it's to pretend, you know, to sort of stress some reality that the problems we face are huge, which means that the struggles we have to launch have to be not just immediate, that's necessary against the war, etc., etc., but they have to be medium and even long term. And that, as I said to those of you who were present last night, requires politics in some shape or form. <coughs> it is not something that we can jump over. We know the politicians are all tainted, but the example of South America shows that an alternative politics of a new type can be and should be created to challenge that. Because without those politics, we can't go forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Tarek. I'm going to open up the discussion now. And um, you're probably familiar with this already, but just for people who aren't, um, we'll limit the contributions to three minutes. And after two minutes, I'll tap my pen on the table to remind you. Obviously, you don't have to make a contribution for three minutes. It can be much shorter than that. We can ask a question, if you like. Um, you can also contribute to this. There have been lots of questions, and my time is limited, so I, I won't be able to answer all of them. Um, on the first one, whether we're in the same period as we were before the First World War, my answer is no. Uh, we are not. We have a single imperial power with overwhelming military strength, and we live in the nuclear age. And this power has the capacity to destroy virtually every rival militarily. We are not in a situation where we have any political economic rival to this power. We have some economic rivals who have their own problems. Uh, and the political rivals are few and far between and largely confined at the moment, apart from the social movements and anti-war movements, largely confined to South America, with all their contradictions and weaknesses, which I've written about, nonetheless a step forward. Uh, U.S.-German relations were very close, especially economic relations between the big U.S. corporations and the German corporations prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor. It was the attack on Pearl Harbor and Germany deciding to back the Japanese, which then forced American corporations to pull out of many of these deals. Though so you're right, they have been uh, uh, you know, documented uh, uh, widely. There's no big problem about that. Um, the other point <coughs> which I should have mentioned, but I didn't, is that the American empire is the first empire in history which because of the larger rivals it confronted, i.e. communism, which threatened social change, anti-colonial movements, etc., <coughs> decided, it's the first time that's happened, to build up the strength, economic and military, of the powers it had defeated in a large imperial war. So the Germans, the uh, Japanese, were built up as strong economic <coughs> powers. Uh, and if you compare how they dealt with Iraq, in you know where they destroyed the entire infrastructure of the country, <coughs> in Germany, 50% of the fascist infrastructure was preserved. In Italy, 70%. So all the people in the military intelligence within the army who had actually worked and fought against the United States, worked for the fascist governments, were integrated into the new structure for the big Cold War struggle, the life and death battle of capitalism versus communism as they, they saw it. That situation no longer exists. And Islam, to come to the point here, is an enemy of convenience. Sometimes it's an enemy, at other times it's an ally. They use it as they see fit. The, most, the, the Muslim country they work most closely with is a, a, a Wahhabi dictatorship in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the modern version of, so-called modern version of Islamism they work closely with is Turkey. 
a central member of the eastern flank of NATO, which they're using in the Middle East. On the Middle East, very briefly, those of you who want to read my detailed opinions on the current situation on the Middle East, uh, I have a text in the latest issue of the New Left Review, which you will find if you go to newleftreview.org, uh, on giving, it's a debate with another, uh, uh, with a scholar, uh, on, on the Arab revolutions. By and large, my view on this, summarized very rapidly, is this. The Egyptian and Tunisian uprisings, crucially important, took the whole world, including the United States and the Europeans, and including the secret polices of the Arab world, totally by surprise. They've said it. They were not prepared for it. And that, of course, was amazing. <coughs> and we celebrate it to this day. But once again, the, pol the question arose in these uprisings of politics. You couldn't do away with politics despite the scale of the mass uprisings, because vacuums have to be filled. And the vacuums that were filled in Egypt and Tunisia were the Muslim Brotherhood or Ennahda governments, who claimed to be moderate Islam. Uh, and these governments basically, in both cases, did deals with the United States. I mean, it's very, very clear. The deal was done with the United States before they came to power. If you look at the speeches uh, Morsi made in uh, Washington, D.C., his deputy Harrod made to the uh, interviews with the Wall Street Journal, they were very clear. We're going to collaborate with you. We want to further deepen our strategic relationship with you. And as for opening the tunnels in Palestine, going to Gaza, which was a promise, don't worry, we're not going to do that. This particular government, actually, uh, Mubarak used to use gas to flood the tunnels to Gaza. They're using sewage. Gas clears sewage is more effective. So have no illusions about what's happened and no be surprised. There was no other political alternative in Egypt. And even in cities. Here the question of historical memory is very important and alternative. Even cities totally in the hands of the masses for two, three days, as in at the case of Alexandria, had nobody there to suggest that they hold the city, that they prevent the army and the, sec the security forces had fled. Who was to hold that city together? No one. That is the city where the left nationalist candidate got the largest votes, interestingly enough. But the the outcome has been the emergence of governments which have done deals. I mean, as I say, I've written about this at length. The key question which comes up on Syria, <coughs> uh, sorry, the second part of that is, once they were taken by surprise, they were determined not to be. So they intervened in Libya, and they're intervening in, in Syria. And in my opinion, what is now going on in Syria is that you have possibly 20% of the population, mainly the minorities, backing the government. It's not without any support at all. 30 to 35% backing the various members of the Syrian National Council, and a huge number of Syrians alienated from both and desperate for this wretched war to end. It's an ugly stalemate. And it's the United States are backing and the European, the British, and the French backing one side, the Saudis backing another faction, the Qataris backing the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood. It's a mess. But that intervention there is, have no doubt. Because once taken by surprise, they then act very rapidly to prevent themselves being surprised again by trying to get in and maneuver the situation. Which is why an anti-war movement faces problems sometimes because the left and progressive forces are divided. The images on the screen are horrific. Which images you see depends on where you live. Uh, and people get worked up very, very easily and say, well, okay, perhaps on the case of uh, Libya, many good people supported the so-called uh, no-fly zone over Benghazi forgot to oppose the six-month bombing of Libyan cities by NATO, which have killed at least 15 to 20,000 people. That doesn't matter. So this is the problem we face, and it's sometimes tricky to negotiate these problems, but we have to try as much as we can. Look, China. 
This has come up time and time again, and it's obviously a huge question. The Chinese, the growth of capital in China, and the decision by the Chinese Communist Party to take the capitalist road, as they put it, from the point of view of the Chinese economy and Chinese status in the globe, from their point of view, it's been a huge success. But, and don't think that the Chinese leadership is not aware of what happens when you have a huge, massive increase in the size of to use an old-fashioned word, the proletariat. There are strikes, there are attempts to fight the depredations of capital, and they are very nervous about it. Just as a footnote, they invited a, a leading British historian some years ago from Cambridge, the, the think tank of the Politburo, and he said, this is what I want to talk about. And they said, no, 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 we're not interested in these airy fairy talks. We want you to give a straight talk to our think tank, where Politburo members will be in attendance, on how Britain avoided a social and political revolution in the 19th century. <laughs> <laughs> so don't think that these guys are unaware of what happens. And they were interested in the British experience because as <coughs> Europe was erupting in 1848 everywhere, how did Britain stay insulated? So they know this and the size of the Chinese, as, uh, China is so large that, you know, I hope it happens that you will have uh, one day uh, Chinese, uh, the Chinese people, the Chinese masses, workers, peasant students fighting to improve, change, alter, uh, and create a new system, which is neither the past nor the present, uh, and see if they can move forward. But don't underestimate the, 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 the people ruling that particular country. The big question is, are they going to become an imperial power? Not so easy. A, were they to break off relations, that ha as happens if you're about to clash with the United States and Europe, don't forget. It's not just when we talk about the United States, they've got Europe as a central, you know, ally, economically, socially, uh, militarily. Not just Western Europe, but now with Eastern Europe, they have a new set of satellite states. If you look at the number of countries represented in Afghanistan, it is huge. Even the tiny Eastern European states saying, please, sir, can I send a few troops in just to show my loyalty to the great empire? Uh, so it's, it's the, the, the situation from that point of view favors the United States. The Chinese are not, no, they, are un, they are aware of this. They also realize that one reason the Soviet Union collapsed in, a, in such an appalling way was that they tried to compete with the Americans militarily, which wrecked their economy, by the way. And the Americans, I remember the Economist cover when the Russians tried to start it competing. The Economist cover was, oh, the joys of rearmament. They knew they had them. And the Chinese are not going to do that. If you look at their military expenditure, it's rising. But compared to, to the United States, the rise is very limited. I think they will build an effective fighting force to defend themselves. And anyone who challenges their immediate interests, like in Taiwan, for instance, as they see it, or <coughs> in, the, in the China seas. And uh, that they will do. Beyond that, I don't And with North Korea, the Chinese are very fed up because of the characteristics of that regime, which is effectively trying to pay, get the Americans to pay it money to buy, it, so buy off its nuclear weapons. It's been doing this for ages. And the United States won't do it. Why? Because they say that if the Korean Peninsula is united, you have the South Korean generals will then merge with large chunks of the North Korean army, it will be a nuclear power. If North Korea is a nuclear power, China is a nuclear power, it becomes impossible to stop the Japanese from getting nuclear weapons. If the Japanese get nuclear weapons, the Americans think that will change slightly the relationship of forces in the region. So they resist these things because they see what their, what their uh, uh, long-term um, interests are. The new scramble for Africa, 
is partially designed to challenge the Chinese economic encroachments, which as one of the speakers said, are interesting, less exploitative, but less, it's relative. It's not that there's no exploitation, it is there, but it's cleverly handled and often the Chinese build uh, infrastructure have social infrastructural developments in African countries which benefits them. But of all the continents in the world, when opinion polls are taken, the most pro-American is Africa, by the way, worth bearing in mind. Not Asia, not South America, but Africa. Af even there's more, more, much more criticism in uh, Europe uh, uh, to it. Um, Palestine, someone asked a question about Palestine. Look, I think that it's a huge tragedy, but I think that the entire strategy of the PLO and now increasingly of Hamas has been defeated. It's been defeated. This idea of a two-state solution which they've pushed and which was dependent on the Israelis giving them a few crumbs, the no Israeli government today is prepared to do that. They don't care, they've got the support of the Europeans and the Americans to do more or less what they want to do, except fighting a war with Iran. That hasn't been green-lighted. Occasional bombing attacks on Syria permitted. But as far as Palestine is concerned, the Israelis have won that battle. They're very foolish and short-sighted, but they have won it. And the longer the Palestinian leadership there's no such thing as a Palestinian authority. The only authority in that region is the IDF. Gaza is like a ghetto, an enclave. What to do? I've, always, I've been arguing now with Palestinian friends, with some of them, because some agree, is that the idea of a two-state solution is gone. The Palestinians will never get a sovereign state. Full stop. At the most, tiny little Bantu stars, if that overlooked by the Israelis. So better to go for a one-state solution and say we don't care how long it takes, we are people from this region, we're not going to go away, there's no Palestinian authority, we are prepared to be citizens of the world, we don't care. But we're not going to go along with this farce anymore, which then throws the ball back into the uh, uh, Israeli court and that of its backers and they do what they do. It's stupid to maintain this pretense. That strategy was defeated by the Oslo Accords, and it's never picked up since. Uh, and one has to accept the defeat of that strategy, not of the Palestinians and their long-term aims and struggles. And those, I think, now have to be, and that is what we should support, a single-state solution with equal rights for all the people who live in this new entity, whatever it's called, be they Jews or Muslims or Christians or sects or subsects within any of these religions. That is the only way to move forward. There is none other, in my opinion. To, to imagine that there are others is to just prolong illusions in something that disappeared a long time ago. And I think it would also, in the long run, be best for that part of the world. Okay, thanks.